Welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We're your co-hosts on this journey of creativity and productivity. I Create Daily is for artists in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. I Create Daily is a movement for creators serious about your art. If you're into creating anything, this podcast is definitely for you. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey. Hello and welcome to the I Create Daily podcast, a movement for creators serious about their art. I'm Devani. And I'm Leora. And we first met today's guest through a panel we participated in together, hosted by I Create Daily guest Joshua Robertson. Christy Stratus is an award-winning writer, author, and editor where she puts her degree in English literature to good use. Christy is the author of Anatomy of a Darkened Heart and Brotherhood of Secrets, the first two books in the Dark Victoriana collection. Christy has had short stories and poetry published in Gnosko Literary Journal, Andromeda Review, 99 Fiction, and various anthologies. An avid reader of all genres and world literature, Christy reads everything from bestsellers to classics to indies. Christy is also the host of two podcasts. One is called the Creative Edge Author Showcase, where she interviews authors about their work, stories, and writing advice, and The Writer's Edge, which features discussions from various author panels. Christy's editing company, where is Positive Proof pro.com that's pr- sorry i got it backwards proof positive pro.com <laughs> which of course we'll link here where when where she's editing manuscripts for um authors and something went wrong there day money i missed my note where's the rest of that i must have not pasted that in so we'll get into that in the conversation we'll welcome christy thank you so much for having me it's so great to talk to you both again good to see you and yeah we we started uh, conversing as we were waiting for Joshua's panel to get started. What was the name of that panel we were supposed the to have? Writers that? Imperfect and something about diving into the creator's mind, which we'll link mm-hmm. in the show notes. Yeah. And so I was look. I was just so surprised because I didn't realize that you also, I was trying to figure out what it is that you were doing with your proof positive pro. So we're just looking forward to, I mean, I know you have the editing company, but there were some other things about that that I didn't understand about curating manuscripts and all of that. So our audience is going to be so delighted to learn more from you because many are writers, uh, fiction writers in particular, and a few are editors and you're both. So you like do it all plus you're a podcaster. So let's go back to how did you get started? And we just heard from you too, that you left your job job just a year ago doing your passion thing full time. So how did you get started though, being a writer and editor first? Well, I have a degree in English literature. I always loved um, reading in general. I always loved writing when people say, you know, when did you start writing? I say since I could write that I really started, you know, so I've always loved it. And um, I started being an author. um, Well, what I would call an author, we all struggle with when are we technically an author. um, And a lot of people say just when you start writing. So um, I really went up and down, actually, for anybody out there who sort of doubts themselves, doubts whether they should write, all that kind of stuff. I went through that. <clears throat> Even though I was in an English literature degree, I sort of thought, oh, I'm never going to publish anything. You know, <laughs> I'm just not going to you know, do that. It's going to be impossible. I just don't think it can happen. And at the same time, I would start writing because I just couldn't not write, you know? And um, I found actually a contest for, it was the Poetry Society of Virginia. And I submitted something that I wrote. I just, I, you know, a lot of times with poetry, I just feel some kind of strong feeling and I, I, and that's what I write about. And so I sent it in on a fluke, just thinking, eh, no big deal. It's going to be forgotten in no time. And I won. And I was like, whoa, are you serious? And um, that got me thinking, well, maybe I could write, you know, and it sounds really kind of almost silly that, you know, you would love writing so much, think you couldn't, and then submit to a contest, you know, but that's really just how it worked. And it's sort of like one of those things that was meant to be in a way, I think, um, to just sort of show me, hey, stop trying to give up on this, you know, so after um, I graduated, again, I went into that place of self doubt. And, um, you know, we all struggle with that all the time. And I thought, well, I, you know, what, where am I going to publish? What am I going to do? And 
it was the same kind of thing. I ended up writing because I couldn't stop myself and I ended up getting published like one of my short stories and then another one. So like just for those of you out there that doubt, we all do. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't mean anything. It's just the way we all are as creatives. And in terms of my editing business, um, I did, I've always liked editing. I started editing um, actually in college. I was a writing tutor and um, I loved sort of, I've always loved analyzing literature and then trying to figure out how I think it could have been done either better or what was great about it or anything along those lines. And so after college, I started when I was trying to get into, you know, writing and accepting that I can do this, <laughs> I'm capable and all that. Um, I started my author platform and without knowing much about it and saw on Twitter that there were a lot of authors who were not getting editing work done because they either couldn't afford it or they'd had bad experiences. And I thought, well, I'd really love to edit, but you know, a lot of times, editing like corporate jobs are not really, it's not what I'm looking for. I really want to just do my own thing. You know, I want to offer my own prices and help those who just don't have, you know, like the capacity to hire someone who costs a lot or aren't going to be traditionally published, whatever it may be. So um, that's kind of how I got started. And, um, and I ended up meeting a lot of authors who were like me and sort of like, I don't know if I'm capable and I could pick out like what they did really well and what they needed help with and encourage them. And that, felt a lot better than sort of sort of the corporate feel of being an editor also. So that's how I got started there. Wow. Were you a corporate, was that your main job being a corporate editor or um, like, how do you know the difference between the corporate editing versus the editing for books? Is it because you had a career in corporate editing and that was sort of your day job and then you transition? It wasn't. It was something I was interested in, actually. And when I was looking at these jobs, you know, when I was looking at the application process and everything, you start as an editorial assistant at best, you know, and I was sort of looking at what that is and the number of manuscripts you're reading and passing over and, and sort of deeming as having not enough talent or quality or whatever it may be. And um, I was reading, you know, other people's blogs who were doing this and finding that it's really a sort of um, heart-wrenching work in a way because you may believe in something but it, that doesn't mean it's going to get published it doesn't mean that author is going to get the help they really need and you're just going through things so fast you know and for some people they love that you know it's just a really great challenge for them and for me it was just sort of the opposite I don't want to be like racing through things and trying to acquire something and then being told it's not really what the market is looking for or what we're publishing right now or something and losing that talent it just seemed ouch, you know, it just seemed like it would hurt a lot. So um, I actually did not go in that direction. Um, and I ended up being in um, project management, which is sort of an opposite. It's not very creative. Um, it's sort of the opposite, but it did teach me a lot of the skills I needed to know to organize my time and uh, as both an editor and an author. So I can't say I regret it. It's just uh, sort of, it seems like it went like this, my path, you know, instead of going straight like that, <laughs> kind of funny. <laughs> went around the, the block and back. So it was yeah, really exactly. Cute. Well, and it, back to the, it, not only were they different, very different, but project manager is also potentially very stressful. Whereas mm -hmm. writing and reading and editing is so much more relaxing and calming, right? That's right. That's a, that's so true. You, you really nailed it there. Um, my job was extremely stressful. It's really a 24 seven type of job. And, um, when somebody else messes up on the team, you're held responsible. It's your problem. Somebody gets sick. You have to make sure that work gets done no matter what. And, um, you know, it's just a very, very stressful environment. So, you know, doing what you love is always less stressful, no matter what that means, you know, to some people, maybe project management is what they love and they find it less stressful because they love it. But if you love creativity, then something that's very, you know, it's this and then it's that and then it's that is really not what you want to do with your life. It's almost more stressful because it's the opposite of how you feel. So, you know, it definitely helped with structure. But it did, like, uh, it, was, it was tough at times, um, not being able to write much and edit much. Ugh, that was really difficult. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, as mom mentioned in your intro, you, or sometime in the beginning, you left your corporate job about like a year ago, I think. Mm -hmm. What, so you, did you start your editing company while you were working? And how did that transition go for you? 
I did start it while I was working. I started it while I was at my full-time job. I actually started it five years before I quit. So I, I really had a good lead in there, you know, and I started out because I had really no reputation as an editor yet. You know, you can have a degree, but it doesn't mean much until you can say, but I've edited this manuscript and that manuscript, and here's the proof of my work, you know. So I started out, um, you know, just doing things for free, only 10 manuscripts, and, you know, just to prove, hey, I can do this, I'm capable, here's what you're getting. And so from that, I just did an exchange for a testimonial, an honest testimonial. And um, that's how I started my business, actually. And then I went into, um, I started out charging a very low amount to continue, like, it almost wasn't even worth what I was being paid just so that I could get the experience. And again, like continue to prove, okay, I'm good at this. Here's my, you know, catalog of what I've worked on. That's really important. So I did that. And then at some point I was so overwhelmed, but like I said, the, the pay was so low. I had to then, um, in, increase to what I'm, you know, charging now. Um, and so I went somewhere in between what, you know, what people, I wanted people who were serious about their craft, you know? So I wanted to make sure that the price was something that was affordable to indie authors, self-published authors, but it would also attract those people who really are serious about their work and are just doing this for fun and just like, hey, I have it edited. I don't care. It costs $50. What's the difference? You know, we don't want that either. <laughs> That's too much. Yeah. So I did build it up for um, five years, and it came to a point where the project management job was really, um, I was either going to have to, quit writing and quit editing because it was getting so intense and they wanted me to get a certification, which was great at the same time as if it's not your dream, that's not where you want to go. Yeah. That is again, just increasing the stress and the time that you're spending. I would have had no time for what I loved. So um, on the other hand, my editing business was really booming and I couldn't, I had to choose which way was I going to go. And the choice was an easy one in the way that, I loved one thing, you know, it wasn't like I loved both. Right. I loved one thing. Right. So I got really fortunate in that way. Um, I know that in the last time we all met, we talked about the law of attraction right. and um, I sort of begged the universe to give me a direction. Like, what am I supposed to do with myself? And instead it gave me the choice. It said, mm -hmm. here you go. Here's the branch. Now you have to choose. And so it was still up to me, um, but it was a very obvious decision. And so that's the point that I left my full-time job when I was sure I could support myself and I had enough to go on. Right. Well, that's really smart. Yeah. There's so much in here that we want to, to expand on some more because this is like perfect for our audience. There's so many people in our audience who are at varying degrees of mm -hmm. either aspiring writers, aspiring editors, already published, etc. So um, I want to go back first to when you were working your five for the five years and you knew where you wanted to actually, I'm going to go back even further. Let's go back to when you said you didn't believe that you would ever get published. Now we all, like you said, have, have self doubt, but it's like, that was your passion. You were, you know, you always loved writing. I mean, you were majoring in it. So why do you think that you had the thought that for you, that was not an option in the beginning? It's a great question. Um, I wrote two novels before I even went into college, and yet I still had self-doubt. It's kind of funny. Um, so the novel that I wrote in high school, I really wanted to publish, and I thought, I don't know where I got this impression, but I really thought that if I didn't get published before I went into college, that would be my last chance. That would be it. You know, you're either a full-time writer or you're just not, you know, and like at the time, I didn't there was vanity publishing and self-publishing was not as big yet. I don't even know if it was really a thing yet. So I didn't see that as an option at the time. Um, and the traditional publishers, of course, I really needed to clean my work up to be able to send it to them. And um, my mom is also a writer. She's excellent. She's a great um, editor and proofreader as well. So we were working on it. But the thing was that um, when I look back at my work now, I can see where all the flaws are. And it was very immature. It was amateurish, you know. And it's kind of tough at the time to see what was wrong with it. I wasn't at that point yet. I didn't have the education um, or the learning in general, even if you don't get a college degree, that's okay. Um, and, you know, it's, it's as much as my mom was helping me, she was doing an awesome job. It's really, it was probably hard for her to say also, um, you know, look, this is very amateur. <laughs> we need a lot of work here. She's doing her best to help me and encourage me but it's just not at the point where it could be published. And I could see the divide, but I couldn't 
identify what was wrong with it, you know? Yes. So um, that was part of what my problem was. I said, well, there's no way I could get published now. I just don't have the talent. I guess that's it for me. And that's where a lot of my self-doubt came from. And of course, I wasn't considering at the time, I was thinking I'm studying other people's work in English Lit. I'm not, you know, I wasn't doing a teaching degree or anything. It was just straight English Lit with a business um, minor. So, you know, I thought, well, this could lead to editing, but um, I'm not taking creative writing courses. You know, I'm not doing that. So I don't think I really have or will have what it takes. I didn't realize that all the studying of other people's work was going to lead me to being able to analyze my own yeah. and then say, oh, okay, well, now I see where my flaws are, you know? So that's kind of how that self-doubt actually happened. How mm. did your mindset change? Because a lot of people stay stuck if they get in this rut of self-doubt or if they have some event where, like you said, before going to college, you didn't get published. So you were like, that's it. I guess that's not for me. Where, uh, where did... And I know you also mentioned you had several ups and downs of self-doubt. So where, where do, where, what moment or several moments did you finally just decide I can actually do this? And it's really like a journey of getting better, not ta-da, well, I'm great. It was, it was, yeah. was it the poetry contest that began it? The poetry contest did begin it. Uh, that was like, you know, like I said, I couldn't not write. I just, even though I thought, you know, why bother? I just couldn't help it. And so I, you know, like I said, I submitted to that contest, won it. And then in my senior year, I was shocked, just absolutely shocked, you know? <laughs> and then in my senior year, I won another writing contest. And that was a sociology writing one, actually, totally different than what I ever wrote again and what I wrote before. Um, so more academic writing, one that said, wow, that's really interesting. This surprises me again. <laughs> you know, that self-doubt just sticks until you get rid of it. Um, you know, and it can continue for a long time. But um, it was after I graduated, when I had my full-time job, and it was not what I loved, and I really wanted to somehow get out. And um, I found myself feeling very much like, what is the point of, you know, not to get overly like dark or philosophical, what is the point of life if I'm doing so much that I don't like? Yeah. And I feel like, where is my worth if everything I do, I dislike, you know, like, I don't like what I'm doing at all. So um, I sort of at some point, I, I was in that sort of spot that a lot of us get into where I have a job I don't like. Um, I'm watching too much TV after work, I'm really doing nothing else. And I feel like, like I said, where is my worth? And um, at that point, I said, okay, I, I feel like I need to write something. And I was trying to figure out, I was keeping it too much in my head and thinking, well, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. And then I finally said, that's it. It's going to have to be good enough. And I just started writing and I just forced myself to put it down on paper, even though I felt almost embarrassed with what I was writing. And it turned out it wasn't bad at all. It was just that I really had it in my head that I had a vision of what a writer was. And I had a vision of what it should be. And I had not really learned much about what first drafts were for even, you know, published people. And that they're all starting at the very bottom, right? So um, all of that was stopping me. And I finally just couldn't hold it in anymore and started writing again. And I said, okay, that was a huge release. I feel so much better this is where my worth is. I feel great, you know? And so then I saw, I said, I, I got to cut out the TV and, you know, a little bit at a time I stopped actually watching TV and um, you don't have to stop completely. I still like watch movies and stuff like that, but it was taking up like every extra hour of my time, like, you know, that, and then you have your social stuff and you think that that's what life is, you know? So I started making life so that I could fit in what actually made me feel good. And that's where my real, like, I would say my real writing journey began. Because it's from there that I started doing um, my author platform and then writing a full-length novel um, that, you know, I had written before college but hadn't published. And now I got serious about it, writing a full-length novel. Right. So a, a quote might be something like, you know, your real writing began when you got serious about it. Would that? Yes. That's mean, right. Basically. Yeah. You just That's true. committed to it. You cut out the fluff. You committed mm -hmm. to the thing that you knew you really wanted to do, even though that was the harder thing. But like you also said, you couldn't not write in the end if you had not done that and you had allowed the, the relax in the evening with Netflix or whatever else. Um, in the end, that's the harder thing because then how do you feel about yourself when you're not doing what you've already identified is most important to you? 
That is so, that is so true. And it's also true with the full-time job where uh, I was looking at a certification for project management and that could have gotten me a nice amount of money actually like in my full-time career, but I would have been miserable, totally miserable. So I would have to choose, do I want to be set in terms of money, comfortable, like no problem type of thing? Or would I rather, you know, work my way up on the money side and just be happy? And really it's the happy side. Um, I was struggling more and more with that happiness and I would have like a creative weekend and feel so good. And then I would go into the week and have this crash that was like, you know, I, I didn't have like clinical depression or anything, but it felt like depression on Monday. Like I was that low that I was just like, Oh, what is this life? You know, what am I doing? It was awful, but I still took the time to build up the business before I made that jump. Smart. Fantastic. So sorry to interrupt there. So when you started uh, prioritizing your passion and writing at night and, mm-hmm. and editing, whatever you were building your business at night, um, did you find that rather than being more tired, it actually picked you up and, you know, energized you so that it helped you actually get through the week? It did. Yeah, it kind of worked both ways in a way. Um, At first, it energized me and it was wonderful. And um, like I said, you know, that value that I found in myself then transferred over to work and um, made me a more confident person overall. So it really helped in many, many ways. Um, The creativity I was letting out through my writing, I could then use a little bit more for my work. And stifling all of that was definitely hurting both my personality and sort of my just my development as a person, I would say. So that was a big deal. Um, And then towards the end of, you know, my full-time job, maybe the past year and a half to two years, that's when I started recognizing that it was, it wasn't, it wasn't the writing making me unhappy. It was the fact that I couldn't um, carry that creativity over anymore with the way my job was going. And that's when I started realizing like something's got to give at some point. And like I said, it took, years it was not like an overnight okay I'm just gonna quit you know but it it was it was tough it was a struggle to to make it through which always sounds sort of first world problemy but at the same time when you feel so low (laughs) you know it's not so first world anymore it's 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 tough well and especially in that case you didn't have a clear um like horizon it wasn't clear how long that was going to go on but toward that and you're planning and knowing that it was inevitable eventually were you doing anything extra to work on saving your the money that you were earning in order to build up that reserve before you left yes i definitely was and that's the biggest advice i can give to any entrepreneur before they leave their job if you're able to start your business before you leave your job and get it going It's not just about getting it going and getting the experience and everything. It's about saving that money. So if you don't have to spend it, don't spend it, save it, save it up, you know, just have that bank account building and building because if you make it and spend it, like you can't leave your job ever. You know, one of the things that's important is when you're building that money, it's not just investing in your business. It's also when you leave your work, let's suppose something goes wrong. How long can you survive with nothing, nothing, you know, like rock bottom, nothing. So if you can build yourself to a point that you're confident that you can actually survive not a month, but months or a year or more, you know, that's a really good point, you know, where you can start really thinking seriously about leaving. Yeah. People do it with less than that. But if you want to be super safe, that's definitely the way. And that's, that's what I did. I made sure that I could survive. And especially building a business as a writer and author, even though you have your editing business, which is doing well, just the journey of, being an author that makes enough that you can live on as an author, that's a really long journey. And, and I, I know you know this because you are one and you know many authors, but it's just like having that cushioning is so helpful. Yeah. yeah. And essential. So, so we've heard, you know, some people will say, well, maybe about six months on average, six months worth of, of uh, expenses saved up. So, you know, and yet I think that it's a good point. Really, it's ideally for it to be longer for a number of reasons, including that entrepreneurs don't usually have health benefits. So you have to do it yourself. Um, and what if something goes wrong? And also, like you were talking about in the beginning, and this is one of the things where so many creatives struggle, and that is the concept of working for free. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, there's the, there are the pros out there that say charge double what you think you're worth because you're worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's the opposite advice of work for free. Um, and we're proponents of 
both in a way, but it's all in balance. It's like, yes, charge what, you know, more than you think you're worth once you're established, um, mm-hmm. because then, you know, you will attract the kind of clients that you want that will pay you what you're worth and you have less of them to, uh, you're able to give more quality to those. And you have a cushion. And you have a cushion. But first, like you did, you did the first, I think you said 20 for free or 10 for free. And then you did another, uh, I'm sorry, was it 10 or 20? It was 10, yeah. Okay, and a 10 for free. And then you did another 20 approximately that were at at a significant discount. Mm -hmm. And that's so so important because really that, okay, so you've got your college degree and many people pay for the tuition there, but you really, there's the tuition of establishing your business uh, as well as your clientele. So that's the other place where a lot of times money is needed to promote, to market, to run Facebook ads, uh, whatever, um, Google ads, whatever you're going to do, pay referrals, that sort of thing, whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, that definitely highly, re- I'm glad you mentioned that. Hi- we highly recommend that people create that soft cushion, not to be lazy with, but rather, you know, so that you don't end up on the streets. I mean, we have stories of people who have done that have ended up on the streets and you don't want to start and launch your passion career, you mm-hmm. know, in the streets, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And there are all those stories out there. We, we see a lot of, it's funny because the news has all negativity, but then you see a lot of positive stories about people um, just quitting their jobs and taking off and it's brilliant. And sometimes like, it's great to read this story. Sometimes we could use the balance of the rest of the world (laughs) that uh, does not necessarily have uh, perfect success with this kind of stuff so that we can really hear how that goes. Did they fix it? What was the problem? And then we can learn from it. And that's one of the most frustrating things I've found a lot of writers say, but everyone else is doing it. You know, like I go onto Goodreads and I go into these forums and I see this person just quit their job and they're doing fine. And you know, what about this person? And you know, it is important to know that there's a lot that people don't talk about. There's a lot of struggle. There's a lot of, you know, it's not like I, I sit around and say all the time, like I saved a year's worth of money before I quit, you know, and I'm not saying that all the time, but that's an important point, you know, and sort of um, just to touch back on that, you said something about um, six months is a good balance, a good um, cushion. That is good. Um, the way I was thinking about it was I would like, um, like even a, starter level salary, like one year's worth, you know what I mean? So that you're sure like there's not even a question that you'll make it through a year's worth of job hunting, let's say, um, just to be super specific. But, um, it is, yeah, it is really important to think about, you know, the struggles these people have because, um, a lot of times we see those stories of someone just saying, I quit and I did great, but that's on the rarer side that you literally did nothing beforehand. Right. right. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah, like that's, that is rare, yeah. you know, and that is like a sink or swim. And you hear a lot about people who maybe start something like a restaurant and they need a loan and then, you know, they'd better be ready with all that knowledge first. And they don't talk about necessarily all the research they did, all the time they spent talking to fellow entrepreneurs, yeah. other restaurateurs, finding out what went wrong and what went right and what they wish they'd done. All of that is so important before you leave. And so that's, that's not to overwhelm people. That's to give you more hope, actually, because the more you learn before you leave, the better off you are, the stronger you are the moment you say, I quit. Absolutely. And there's a lot of people on the internet, either they don't have time to expand between I quit my job and now I'm great. That could mm-hmm. have been like, I quit my job and then five years later, now I'm great. Yeah. Like, you don't, you know, you don't know. It could be like, it's been a long journey and now I'm great. And yeah. you just, there's so much lack of context, which is why like interviewing people like you and you have interviews with authors as well who have their journeys and just tuning in to all the different contexts and journeys and longer form conversations is so important. So you get a complete picture and people to look up to who have made it and shared their journey of how they got there. Yeah, that's right. That, that is right. Yeah. And it's, it, it's such an important thing to, to learn from everyone. But like you said, you don't just jump off and suddenly you're perfect. I mean, even I was recently listening to, um, I think Andy Pollock when was doing a, P, a Q and a, he's a, if anybody doesn't know him, he's a fantasy writer. He's um, I think he said he's like 16 or 17 books into his career. And, you know, like a lot of times you look at people like him and you say, Oh, he must've always, it must've been always great because he's just been pouring out writing since something like 2013. I think he said was his first published book. Um, but then he said, 
you know, when he went back to the first one, he said he saw all the things that were wrong with it, not necessarily just writing wise, but genre wise and marketing wise and everything else. And in those years, you know, that you give yourself or even just year, whatever it is that you can do before you quit, that's exactly what you're learning. You're, you're developing your style, you know, even let's say as an editor, um, I learned how to communicate and not to communicate with clients, you know, what was that bonus thing they were looking for, you know, and uh, what's the best way to present something that is um, sort of a weakness without making it seem like it's hopeless or, or you're not good at something. It's, it's not about that. Like, how, what is the best way to communicate that stuff? I got out of the way right before I quit my job. So I was already just like you said, Devani, it's important to learn that stuff first. Yeah, that's a delicate line, especially when you're working with creatives who sometimes we're more touchy, <laughs> you know, like, and hearing like, hey, you know, just straight out saying, you know, that line really sucked. It's not always. The best <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's such a good point about, um, sorry, what was the name of the author that you mentioned? Paula. Andy Pelquin. Andy Pelquin. Pelquin. Sorry. Yeah. Pelquin. Andy, Andy Pelquin. Yeah. So, so many writers, I'm sure you see this as an editor and we'll get more into your editing in a bit too, but um, it's like if the first book isn't a success because there's so much pinned on the first book yeah. because it's like, my God, you have the dream of writing a book and you finally, you know, you wrestle it. through it and you do it in a year or however long later. And now then you've got it published and it, it arrives and it's in your hands and you're holding it and it's on Amazon and then it sits there. You know, it's sort of like that, you know, it's like, it's such a, a disappointment for new authors to realize that the book doesn't fly off the shelf just because suddenly it's on Amazon. And it's the rare cases where that happens in terms of like either uh, somebody's book flies off the shelf because they've been having a long career as an author and suddenly they're being known now the yeah. success, a 10 year overnight success, or because it just happened to the book happened to land with the right publisher and they mm -hmm. got a deal from it. Like that's not, you know, that happens seldomly. Yeah, absolutely. It's on the rarer case. I just saw somebody actually, to your point, um, who was on a forum saying, oh, I'm so upset, like my book isn't selling and the marketing and this and that. And somebody else said, well, it's only been out for two months. So, <laughs> you know, just relax. <laughs> yeah. But, it, you know, when you do do it, when it's you, you are like, how come? Why? You know, all I hear about is success, success, success. And, it, yeah. you know, it takes you a while really getting into the community, um, the real community, to find out that that is not the case. And it's very rare. And um, even J.K. Rowling was rejected 11 or 12 times. And major authors have been rejected hundreds of times. And, you know, here and there, there's a, a fluke or you hit the market just right accidentally or whatever. That's great. I mean, I wish it could be that way for everyone, but uh, it's not going to be. And there's no reason to be discouraged by it. We all feel that, but there really is no reason to be discouraged. It may be, you know, a lot of people say, if you haven't gotten noticed, just keep publishing. Just publish until you finally are, you know? Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, you know, it, it's because the lottery winners are rare. And so basically that's what we're talking about. The, the book that makes it right out the gate is rare. It's based, just like lottery winners are, but what begins to get traction is to keep on writing and to keep on publishing. So you really knowing this in advance, it's sort of like you were talking about earlier. It's not what people talk about very much. And so new writers, you know, rarely imagine uh, or are aware of just, what an uphill climb. It's like they think they get the book written and now their job is done on mm -hmm. to the next book. And then really that's where the marketing begins, like the whole other half of, of it, if not more than half of it, it, that's the uphill battle is getting exposure to it and then writing the next and the next. And so writers going into it or aspiring writers need to know that, need to know that they're like, that's what they really want to do. You know, are you committed? Is it important for you to write? Can you not but write, you know, mm -hmm. stories and that sort of thing? And if that's the case, then by all means, start writing and know that it's going to be a journey and, and find a way to enjoy the journey. The fact that you get to write, even if it's part time, even if it's on weekends, even if it's while you're keeping your job job, when down the road, two years, five, 10, looking back, you won't regret it mm -hmm. if you keep going, keep going in that direction and keep working on it. That's very true. And if you find yourself. <laughs> okay. That's one of the joys of working from home, right? Is we get to work with our animals nearby and the UPS door ringing, ringing or UPS or FedEx ringing the doorbell or whatever, right? <laughs> I know. 
and you know what? It's so good. It's so wonderful, really, because I'm glad that happened. Because, um, and in case people didn't, I think that they probably heard the dog. It. In case we paused it before people heard the dog interruption. Um, you know, when you think about it, living in a corporate environment where there are no dogs, no kids, and whatever, and you know, maybe not even plants. Hopefully, there may be some plants, but it's so sterile, right? And it's like this is life. Life happens. Interruptions happen. Even if you're in a corporate environment, as well, you know, you could be in your office and get a dozen interruptions in a day, um, and so that happens. So we don't mind those things at all. We're muted. Um, Christy, you- I think you're muted. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah, you're back now. Okay. So far, we in the other it? background. Sorry. Okay. No worries. No worries. But yes. Good. No, you're totally right. And um, that you said life is one thing, and I, I like it happening. It's really yeah. nice to be able to actually experience it. Yeah. Whereas it's really funny that you mentioned plants in the corporate world because in the company I was in when uh, we moved buildings, they said no plants allowed, so we didn't even have that. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> it was yeah. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> You know, and it's like, like living things around and just natural. It's one of those things that when people started working from home, it was such a um, still frowned upon in the early stages that they were so afraid to, you know, have it evident or visible that there were any kids anywhere nearby or anyway, it's understandable, but I think we've come such a long way. Well, people mm-hmm. recognize the entrepreneur lifestyle is life happens. There are going to be interruptions. The doorbell could go off and we, and it doesn't mean, you know, that we can't can keep on doing our job and working our intellectual, uh, you know, what do you call <laughs> property still here? You know, our ability to carry on a conversation is still here, just like in life. Reminds me of that video that went viral of the guy on TV, on national TV being interviewed, and his little daughter happened to <laughs> accidentally, like, wander into the room. <laughs> Um, came in and was or the was nanny like, it was like a nanny that came in and dragged the child out in the background you I know, know. And, it was so funny yeah, yeah. We'll have they, to link they were to trying to if we can yeah keep a straight face and do the interview yeah <laughs> that is yeah that is really funny and you know corporate people get very very annoyed with that but it's it's nice to not have that happen anymore you know everyone who's on the more creative side and just works from home seems to appreciate it and really get it. And it's, it's so much nicer. It's a lot less stressful yet again. Another thing that's less stressful. That's right. Definitely. Well, so on the end, you know, this could be happening to writers in our audience who are working from home. And so you do like, how did you decide or when did you just first publish your first book and how did you decide to like, like I'm trying to get the balance of what you were working on. So you left and uh, five years ago, but you'd already published your first book. By then, so she left left? One year sorry, ago. sorry, one year ago, uh, worked for five years, left one year ago. Did you already publish your first book before then? My first book was published in 2015. Um, I chose to self-publish. Once I discovered the wonderful world of self-publishing, I said, that's the route for me, <laughs> you know? So I, I don't mind um, editors, you know, working on my book and telling me what's good or, or not so good in it, and what needs to be fixed and all that. It's great. But the idea of a traditional publishing company or some other company um, saying, well, that's not what's popular right now. We'll have to, you know, put this in it and throw that in it to make sure that it just to me, you know, and I'm making it sound a little bit more, you know, of course it would all be integrated nicely, but to me, that's how it feels like throwing stuff in that I don't really want in there or that I don't really think fits, you know? So again, totally different if an editor says to you, you know, look, this works and doesn't work. But to just put something in to sell it, yeah, that wasn't for me. Um, so yeah, while I was still in my full-time job, um, I decided that this was, it was actually NaNoWriMo that started me writing my first novel, um, National Novel Writing Month. And <clears throat> I came across that and was like, oh, what is this great thing? Like I was discovering so much at the same time. So um, I said, okay, I have an idea and I'd really love to try my hand at a full-length novel again. This is the perfect way to do it. So I didn't make it to the 50,000 I never have in a month. My, my novels definitely take a lot longer than that. Um, part of that is the fact that it's historical fiction. Um, but part of it is just that there was too much going on at the time, you know. So I had my editing business and I had my full-time job and I was writing. Um, right. So it was too much to do 50,000 in a, in a month. But it got me really rolling. Um, it got me really moving. I started recognizing some of the Weaknesses I had in, for example, you remember I said, like, sometimes I would be embarrassed to, like, type just what was in my head. I would be like, this is embarrassing. I don't want to put it down. Well, NaNoWriMo forced me to break that. 
And so I still had that trouble, you know, by that time of just feeling like, but it's not good enough. And so I said, all right, this is something I really have to work on. And NaNoWriMo helped with that. I would go in my notebook and instead of making sure the sentence was perfect before I wrote it down, you know, I would purposely like scribble things out and stuff just to make myself feel better about messing up, about not doing something perfectly. And um, so like a lot of this stuff, NaNoWriMo, uh, researching self-publishing, doing self-publishing, um, balancing all these different jobs and work and stuff, just you learn so much more than you think you're going to and you recognize so many more things about yourself both strengths and weaknesses that you can play off of and build it's really just amazing it's a it's a it's more than just a journey to publishing it is a journey within yourself too Mm, wonderfully said yeah that makes so much sense well I love how a lot of your self-doubt seem to start to sort of disappear or leave um as you began the journey of the process itself and just diving into doing it as opposed to keeping it all in your head. Like it was almost like you just had too much in your head. So you're like, none of it's going to work because there's too much here, but then you just started and that got you going and it helped just, Mm -hmm. there wasn't, you replace the self doubt with just doing the with action. Yeah. Yeah, With doing work. That makes so much sense. So, um, as an editor, um, did you first, so you started serving clients for free. Mm-hmm. Um, and now let me just back up for a second, because I'm wondering as an editor, how far can you edit your own books before you have to turn them over to someone else to edit? I work on, um, I write a first draft and my first draft, my first slash rough draft is um, I edit it very heavily. So it's, it's never like I rewrite stuff from scratch or something. Um, when people mention multiple drafts, I'm always sort of like, how does that work? Because I have like one draft that I end up reading back so much that I edit it frequently, you know? So I never really like say, okay, this is a good start. Let me start a new draft or something like that. Um, And so I edit that into shape pretty much or what I consider shape. (laughs) And um, I am a pantser. So I do have to edit you know, a lot of my stuff. By the time I get to the end, there's a lot that has to be changed. In the beginning, I go back, I try to find where the character development is lacking. There's always someone I've left out, you know, and then um, once I feel that I have a book that I would be happy to publish, that's when I send it to the editor because I know it's not ready really. But um, if I feel that it's at that point, that's when I think, okay, now it's time to set it off. Now, one of the things I've learned is, yes, it's good to set deadlines for yourself. It's not always great to announce a publication date until you've gotten the edits back and you yeah, see what kind right. of work you're in store for. Because yeah. I have made that mistake, and man, is that ugly. <laughs> it can be way more pressure than you really need, and um, you don't want to be rushing those edits. That, that can really make, you can make some big mistakes there. Yeah, so really the time to announce the published date is when you the manuscript is in the can on the way to the publisher. And printing. <laughs> and printing, would you say? Could you say that one more time? Sorry. The, the, a time to announce the publication date. Yes. The manuscript is on the way to publishing, to printing, mm-hmm. that, right? Is that like, yeah, that? I, I think so. I mean, ideally, that's what you would do. Um, yeah, ideally, what you would love is to have one edit and then a proofread and then you're going on and publishing it. Not everybody can afford to do an, ebri- an edit and a separate proofread, but it's ideal, you know? Yeah. So that's what I go with because it's my company and I'm really lucky <laughs> that I can, I have access to wonderful editors. So, um, you know, I use my own senior editor. And so um, I send it off to her and after I do the edits and I send it for the proofread, I say, okay, now I know because proofreading stuff is much simpler. It's really way simpler to fix. Um, and that's when I say, okay, I know what my schedule can be now for sure. Um, so you could wait until you're sending it off to like literally uploading it on Kindle or something, but even just the proofreading stage, if you, if you know, this is someone, you know, that you can trust who will get it back to you when they say that they're going to get, get it back to you, then you could announce at that point. Um, one of the toughest parts of being an editor is when somebody comes to you and says, okay, um, I have a publication date set here. I need you to do this like in two weeks, you know, (laughs) and you're sort of like, well, I want to take you on, but I have other clients on one hand. And the other hand is you don't know how long this is going to take, you know, it it could require a lot of rewriting. Maybe it won't, but, um, it does sort of get daunting for your editor if you do that, because then they start to consider, or I start to consider how many changes can this person really make? 
Right. So I'll be suggesting things, but it doesn't mean they're going to be able to do them, you know? So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Right. How many editors do you have working for you in your company? It's actually right now, it's actually just me and one other person We're, we will be looking to expand at some point, but um, you know, it's, it's tough to find someone that you can really trust. Um, and I've experienced that also in when I was a project manager, I would um, manage a team of freelancers and we were consistently, you know, getting someone new on board, finding out, you know, they didn't stick to deadlines or they didn't really have um, enough, like the experience that they said they had didn't actually show in the work and you're constantly turning them over. Well, I can't afford to do that with clients, you know, <clears throat> there's no way that's a big corporation. It's different with a small business, I need to be absolutely sure that this person is someone I can depend on and is pushing out quality work. Um, so it does take time to really look for someone. And, um, you know, I've worked with one or two people in the past. It, it has not been what I wanted it to be. So I'd, I'd rather take my time with that. So it is two people, but we do stagger, um, what we do stagger our projects to make sure that we can take incoming projects a little bit easier than some other companies. Well, it's a really good point because the problem with, as an editor, supervising other editors, it's like mm -hmm. one of the only ways to do that, especially in the beginning for a while, is to basically do their work again. Mm -hmm. You know, you yep. have to review. So now you're reading the original and then you have to read whatever yeah. that they've edited. So then it actually doubles the work than if you were just doing it for, for a client. So, but in the beginning, you know, you're building, if, you're, if you want, if your goal is to build um, you know, and your editing company into a larger agency, so to speak, then it's one of, it's back to those things you have to put in the work to make that, to grow that, right? That's right. And, um, you know, you, you may want to certain, you have to figure out what you're looking for too, you know, when it's the same, if you're an author and you're looking for an editor as if you're an editor and you own a business and you're looking for an editor, it's sort of similar. You need to come up with what is it that makes a great editor and, um, you know, education or not, um, because I know that sometimes that's an issue, especially with corporations where they want a certain level. It's, it's attention to detail heavily. And, um, you know, if, if somebody seems to pay attention to detail, they'll send you like a sample and that's good. But then when they do the real work, are they focused? Are they really as detail oriented as they seemed they were going to be? Um, that's something I would recommend to anybody who's searching for a new editor. You should be doing a sample always. And if somebody tells you they can't do a sample, you don't want to hire that person because you have no idea what their work is going to be like. Right. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's the same. It is the same, like trying to hire someone. And like you said, you're redoing their work when you go through it. So you need to be able to take the time for that as well. Right. Well, and yeah, I mean, that's like the double whammy too. Your agency name is, right. is on that's that right. work. And you, so if they've missed something or haven't done it according to your standards and yet it goes out the door, which, you know, at some point it has to because you can't do the double the work doubly. You can't pay for someone else to do that and still do it yourself. Yeah, I, I can see it would be a very tricky thing. So that makes a lot of sense. Do you um, do ghost writing for fiction writers? Do you do any ghost fiction writing? I don't as of now. I'm not going to say I would never because I find it to be a very interesting kind of uh, idea. And sometimes I'll see, like, I've, I've worked with ghost writers before as their editor or proofreader. Um, and it is something like you can't just hire a ghostwriter and then publish. It's, it's, it's the same thing as hiring, you know, just being a writer. You need to have an editor no matter what, right. um, at least a proofreader. <laughs> I'm just trying to drive the point home because I can't, I can't tell you how many um, clients I've actually had, unfortunately, from them publishing their book thinking it was ready and getting terrible reviews based on just proofreading. And it's, it's painful. Like, you never want to see that happen. Um, so, you know, just be sure to hire someone who's really good. But I think, I think ghostwriting is a really interesting um, thing. I would love to try at some point, but I'm not there yet. Okay. So um, as a, when you were editing, sorry, when you're already an editor, sorry, I'm, I'm backtracking. Let me get back to my original question. It was going to have to do with freelance platforms. So <laughs> you're, you don't do ghostwriting. So you're writing for yourself, but you're editing for others. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's right. Not yeah. doing any writing for others. Have you? Did you start um, on a freelance platform as an editor, like like Upwork or freelance or any of those things? I didn't start that way. Um, I I really did actually start based off my author platform. Once I saw where the problems were with hiring editors, 
uh, and proofreaders, that's really, that was my jumping off point. And um, I literally saw somebody who I'm still in touch with today. And um, he's not writing much anymore, but I'm still in touch with him today. And he had been saying something on Twitter about, you know, really looking for an editor, but not being able to afford one. And I remember I had um, private messaged him and said, you know, I'm getting into this. I have the education. It's just that I don't have any books behind me. I'd be willing to do it for free if you could do a testimonial. And he was like, I just sent your name to three other people, you know, <laughs> because yeah, everyone absolutely. needs an editor, you know? Absolutely. And, and authors who go through that probably have author friends who, who need that too. Exactly, you know? exactly. And, you know, a lot of times somebody, someone will hire an editor and um, maybe it'll work out for a little while and maybe they want to move on for one reason or another, you know, so people are always looking around. But, you know, in terms of um, platforms like Upwork and things along those lines, I've personally never used them. I did one one um and i forget what it was called it's it doesn't exist anymore um and that was an interesting process because of course being through a different company sometimes it sort of is difficult in the way that you can't like um necessarily get directly in touch with somebody so i had one thing that was that was really tough where um i edited someone's book and they didn't understand some things about grammar and so they came back and gave me a lower rating because they said oh um, she doesn't, you know, that I didn't understand or I used too much of something. And I said, don't change that. Be careful because you're messing with the tense now. And you know, like that's, yeah. uh, it's not just a crutch word. That is not a crutch word. It's actually grammar. So like, you know, but then you get a lower rating for, you know, someone not understanding grammar and it's not really fair. So <laughs> that, that sort of turned me off a bit. Which is why they need an editor. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, oh, but then, funny. but then taking your own advice though, don't give up on the first time if it's not great, but it makes it hard. If it, so, so if for, for people listening and tuning or watching, tuning in who are considering being freelancers, um, mm -hmm. one of the best ways to do it is to start on those platforms for less expensive or even free kind of thing and let them know that you're establishing yourself. You're getting mm -hmm. in because you want to get it, right off the gate. You really have to get those good testimonials and those good reviews. So yeah. But if someone starts that, like as you did, just, mm -hmm. you know, on Twitter, paying attention to what people are saying. And there are tons of authors and aspiring authors out there writing their books so they'd be easy to do. Then that's a great way to get into, like you said, you immediately got three referrals. You know, he forwarded it on to three other people. So that's easy to do. One of the things I'm, I, what I stumbled on earlier is I knew that there was a question I wanted to go back to. You mentioned that, and this is also in case there's anyone listening who might want to apply to you as a possible editor. You said something about you make sure that they send a sample of their work. Can you give an example? Like what kind of sample would someone applying to you for an editor job need to send to you? So what I'll do is, first of all, if you've worked on anything before, of course, I'd love to know what it is so I can check it out on Amazon and probably read through it myself. But besides that, um, that's not always fair because if you're an independent editor, the author decides what changes they'll take on board. Sure. And I've certainly had authors who actually um, reject spelling changes. And it's very frustrating because it's spelled check and not cheek, you know, <laughs> something like that. So um, I do understand that stuff. Uh, you know, you have to understand that. But what I typically do is I have a sample. Um, it's something that is, it's just a sample of writing. It's not a real author's writing or anything like that. But it's a sample created um, with problems. You know, it has spelling issues and grammar issues. It has um, punctuation, but beyond that, it has development issues. And it's only like the first five to 10 pages of what would be someone's novel. Um, but I want to see, you know, what are the comments you would make to this person? How are you phrasing it? Are you treating them kindly, but also telling them the truth? Um, you know, I, I want to make sure you're catching everything, um, especially in a short sample. I mean, when I do a short sample for a client, I'm going over it at least two times, if not more. And that's just five pages. You know, I just want to make sure it's, it's perfect and they're getting the right impression of me. So I expect the same from someone who's going to submit to me. And that is also how it works. At least that's how it worked with when I was a project manager also. Uh, it would be the same thing. If we're going to hire a copy editor, you have to prove that you can do the same sample 100 other people have done. And what's the quality there? We've told you what we expect. Now let's see it in action. So that's exactly what I would be doing. Yeah. Okay. That's Fantastic. smart. Bless you. Here. Sorry, guys. Devani, by the way, has a cold. A mild so, cold. So <laughs> sorry for the occasional <laughs> sneeze. <laughs> You're weathering on. Um, so if so, we want to get to, we'll, we'll kind of close the interview shortly with information on how people can apply to you 
um, to be their editor if they have work that needs editing uh, through your company, proofpositivepro.com. Uh, is it pro or pros? Pro. Yes, you are right. Proofpositivepro.com. Oh, what? we wanted to. Yeah, that's about. what. I, yeah, that's where your is going. Okay. Uh, so I, I'm glad you're keeping track and <laughs> keeping me on track here. So you say under acquisitions for editing work, you said you work with City Owl Press, and this is on your about on your your personal website, which is christystratus.com, and it's S T R A T O S. So actually, I'll spell the whole thing before we go um, because there are a number of different ways you can spell Christy as well. Um, am I, are we pronoun- pronouncing it right? It is Stratus, right? Yeah, you got it right. Okay, good. So um, then you say on here that I work with City Owl Press to acquire manuscripts and work directly with authors who write urban fantasy, romantic suspense, historical romance, and contemporary romance. So what does that mean? Like you acquire the manuscripts and how does that work? So what I do there is um, I just started working with them actually just as I left my job last year, which was really cool. Um, they're a really great smaller press um, that does do marketing. They do help you with marketing um, just to clarify because a lot of places don't and that's one of the issues. Um, but they're a small press that publishes um, anything. It has to be romance or have uh, a strong romantic aspect to it. So if it doesn't have that, then it's not for them. But um, what you can do is you can send me and, you know, thank you for reading my website. That's You can just go there to check it out. Um, but you can basically, my City Owl Press email is there. And um, you can send me a query, uh, which, of course, you can look up how to query. But um, And the first 10 pages of your manuscript. So then I would be looking through it. And, of course, I'm looking for a great writer, but I'm looking for something unique. Um, the more, the better the character development, the more likely I am to, to read it. Um, I'm not someone who's a fan of um, cookie cutter type stuff. And there are many publishing companies that, you know, do that and do great, but that's, that's just not what I'm looking for. So um, definitely looking for something unique. And um, if it's not for me, I will probably pass it on to the other editors there. So it's not like I'm your only shot, you know, <laughs> so don't worry about that. Um, but it's, it's really a great opportunity because, um, like I said, you know, I had wanted to, um, do editing and I had originally thought about doing it in the corporate world, but like I said, you know, it's, you turn away a lot of good stuff just cause it doesn't fit the market. And this is less so, this is more so, is it great? You know, is it just a great book? And that's all there is to it, you know, and sure. Yes. Can we market it and all that, but heavily looking for just quality writing to give other writers a shot. I can't tell you how many manuscripts I've edited that I've been like, why isn't this traditionally published? It's brilliant. It would really bring in a lot of people. Um, so it's, it's been a great experience for me. And um, I do sometimes take other genres, but those are the ones that I, I really enjoy the most. Okay, fantastic. So you're editing to your own company as well as uh, for City Owl Press. Yes, and I would be the editor. I'm not just the acquiring person. I would be editing your manuscript as well. Okay, awesome. fantastic. And again, we'll link to all of that um, here. So as an editor, um, or rather as a writer, so a fiction mm-hmm. writer, what are your writing aspirations from here? Like you have two books published of your own that are just fully your own, not an anthology or something else. Mm-hmm. So what are your writing aspirations? Well, I would love to do more submissions to other short places looking for short stories. Um, that's more a matter of not having the time to look for the places that publish what I'm writing. Um, but, you know, that's something that I would like to do. Uh, I want to keep publishing books in um, my, I call it the Dark Victoriana collection. And what that is, is um, both of my first two books are in that, um, Anatomy of a Darkened Heart and Brotherhood of Secrets. And I call it a collection as opposed to a series because one doesn't necessarily follow the other. They're just related. Okay. So it's all taking care and taking place in the same town, at least those two. And so one of them, for example, takes place from like 1840 to 1861. The other one is more just 1859. Mm -hmm. That's it, you know? So, and you'll have crossover characters, but again, it's not just, you know, let's follow the same characters all the way through. It's different people. Um, So I am working on the third book for that. It's historical fiction. So with all the research, it does take me time. Um, I usually publish about every two years. So this is the year I should be publishing my next book. Again, I'm going to take my own advice and not say any dates, you know, (laughs) but hoping for this year. Um, And I do have other things like um, 
I have short stories and more books that I want to publish in this collection. At the same time, it's sort of just this unending collection that I'm just really enjoying writing, <laughs> you know? So, um, but at the same time, there's a lot of other things that I want to delve into. I have, you know, um, a lot of notes on a fantasy book I'd really like to write. And I have one, uh, a lot of notes on something more in the between 1920s and 1950s that I'd like to write. There's just a lot that I want to do. So I would love if at some point, um, you know, life takes us different places. So I'm not going to say this is my only dream or anything, but I would just absolutely love to have a little bit more time to, to write. And some of that is down to me and just making the time, of right. course. But um, yeah, being able to do a little bit more of that and, and just focus a little bit more on writing would be great. But I love editing, so I can't complain at all. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. I mean, it just makes sense that you're perfectly poised or positioned to uh, grow your editing agency um, mm -hmm. through your expertise with other editors working for you and for your clients. And then that gives you the opportunity to edit as much or as little as you want uh, mm -hmm. in between uh, writing your books. And it just makes sense that, you know, any writer, I think perhaps would lo love to and long to be able to spend more time writing their own work. You know, that just makes mm -hmm. sense because in particular, when you begin, like you alluded to, there's so many things and ideas that you want to pursue. And, and when you begin down the path of writing and creating characters and stories and whatever, you don't run out of ideas. They just mushroom. They just, that's right. They just grow, go crazy with, you know, other avenues of possibility that you'd like. That's to right. Have. Yeah, that's so true. And um, the other thing is that I, I don't feel like that same pain or stress or sadness when I can't write because I'm already doing what I love. So even though writing is like the ultimate for me, you know, it doesn't like kill me anymore to not, not be able to do it for a while. It's okay. Um, because I'm doing something I like a lot more. So, you know, for anybody out there who's thinking, I really want to write, but I like something else. It may turn out and you won't know until you do it, but it may turn out that doing that something else is good enough to make you feel good. And, um, once I quit my project management job, actually, I started understanding a lot of things about, you know, the publishing process. And um, it's very different to write than edit. It's very much easier for me to edit someone else's work than to necessarily apply the same advice to my writing. Yeah. Believe it or not, sometimes it can be a little bit hard. So I've learned a lot about um, actually expressing my creativity um, after I left my project management job that I just didn't seem to be able to actually totally get while I was so stressed mm -hmm. you know, so there's actually a lot to look forward to once you leave your job and, and do what so you really much. like yeah of course the stress you know you're working uh, it just closes out the creative area of the brain you're, you're yeah. almost on survival mode even yeah. part of the time you know? yeah that's so true yeah that's right well we uh, your dog is ready to for <laughs> you to be through with this interview and ours is uh, beginning to act up as well so just good to talk with you all day. Thank you so much for taking the time for sharing all of your experience that you shared. I'm sure that our audience will get a lot out of it. Um, and we really appreciate all that your candid sharing because that's going to help other writers and aspiring writers and editors. And keep in touch for when your next books come out because yeah. we'd love to have you back on talking more about your author endeavors oh yeah and, and before you go is there anything else you would like to share with our audience okay well so we're, we're talk about um so sorry christystratus.com and it's c-h-r-i-s-t-i-e stratus s-t-r-a-t-o-s.com uh, we've got proofpositivepro.com and so we'll include those links or is there anything and, and of course the, your book titles which we talked about earlier and we'll link here as well um, I just moved my notes I don't have that um, here we go uh, Anatomy of a Darkened Heart mm -hmm. and Brotherhood of Secrets great covers great titles by the way beautiful website we love your proof positive website it's so pretty attractive and colorful uh, well done so yeah we'll definitely send people over there but is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience before we let you go? Well, thank you so much. First of all, that means a lot to me, actually. Um, so thank you for having me on. This was really great. I, I take any opportunity I can to share any of the advice I can with other people. There's enough room for everyone. And that's the other thing that I want to say. Um, you know, once you're in the author community, like we all are, if you're someone trying to break in, um, it's not competition. It's really, we're all working together and we all share information. Yeah. So, you know, it's not another stressful thing. Um, we are all working together. And even as editors, you know, some people, um, will refer back and forth if something isn't our specialty or something along those lines. Um, we're all a community. And so, 
you know, I think that's a really important thing to just remember um, instead of writing advice, yeah. just that we're all working together. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm so sorry I forgot to men ask you if you have time to share about your podcast. My goodness, I can't believe we didn't mention that. Um, so cr the Creative Edge Author Showcase and also the Writer's Edge. So would you like, do you have time to tell us about both of those before you go? Sure. Creative Edge Writer's Showcase is actually, um, that's my publicist's, but I host it. So um, we do Creative Edge authors only, but, um, you know, I'm interviewing them, as you said, I'm interviewing them, asking them if they have writing advice, I'm asking them about their careers, I'm looking um, deeper into um, maybe their uh, former careers or how that may have impacted their current, you know, stuff. Of course, that's my story. So I love asking other people about it. It's amazing. Um, so I really enjoy interviewing them there. Those are half an hour, twice a month. Um, it's every other Thursday, the first and the third Thursdays of the month at 9 PM. They are pre-recorded uh, and you can find them on SoundCloud. You can find them on iTunes anywhere. I think it's pretty much anywhere that podcasts are. It's part of the, um, uh, authors on the Air Global Radio Network. And then The Writer's Edge is on YouTube. And that one is, um, I, I'm on a little bit of a hiatus at the moment, um, for good reasons, not bad. <laughs> so, but it is, it does have plenty of videos for you to check out in the meantime, and we will be coming back. And that is also twice a month, sometimes once a month. Um, and I usually do one interview, um, one on one with an author, uh, so we can delve deeply into their process and any advice they might have. And then um, the other one, which is usually at the very end of the month, and also on Thursdays, is um, that one is a live panel. And so you can come and ask questions. And we've had some amazing uh, authors on there, some award winners. Um, it's it's great finding them, tracking them down, and uh, and getting them on, and then you know ha having people getting to ask people they really admire. You know, like how did you do this, or how does it work, or something. And it's wonderful to to speak to them and and um, give them a platform to help other people. Right. Um, so that's what the writer's edge is. And that's all fiction. Is it all fiction writers? Fiction so far, it's all it's all been fiction. Yes. Okay. Um, well, we do do here and there. We do do um, like book reviewers and people like that to help you um, get the word out about your book. Though. That makes sense. Well, the whole thing is the bottom line for anyone who's writer, aspiring writer, etc., is immerse in your craft, immerse in writing, tune in to podcasts like yours, like ours, and the YouTube forums, what have you, um, because you know you can never get enough. You can never know too much, you know, about your craft as long as you're not consuming more than you're doing the writing. Um, and like you said, I'm so glad you said it. It's a collaborative community where people are really trying to support and uplift each other. And the so. same advice for aspiring editors who want to do yes. freelance editing or create an editing agency. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Or hire an editor. Hire, hire a an great editor. great editor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. This was really great. I can't wait till the next time. All right. Also, same for us. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the I Create Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.